We are, we are going to look at the foundation. Why do we need a foundation? Why do we need a foundation? You need foundation because foundation is a structure that carries the weight, the weight of the building, the weight of whatever you are going to put on it. The foundation is that important, is extremely important because foundation will determine the extent to which you are going to build on top of it because the foundation carries the weight. If you, if you build a foundation for a bungalow, it cannot go beyond bungalow. What you are going to have is just that your three bedroom flat with parlor and toilet and all of that. Finish. If you lay a foundation for three bedroom and you put a story building on that, when it collapses, what happens? It's going to kill people. It will, people are going to die. All the money you have invested are going to be wasted. Resources are going to go and a whole lot of things and all of that is not good. So if you are going to build foundation for one story building, you lay the foundation for one story. If it is for five story, you lay the foundation for five story. You cannot add to it. You can't lay foundation for five story and then you want to put seven on it. So uh, some of us here, we have laid the foundation for just babyhood Christian. And if you have laid a foundation for babyhood, there is no way you can get mature. It is not difficult. It is impossible. You can't. So that is why foundation is of essence. Foundation determines the limit of the structure or the weight that building is going to carry. Is that clear? It is the same thing that happens in your marriage. The kind of foundation that you lay in your marriage will determine the extent to which it will go. Because you know something about foundation. Because in this life that we are living, you and I, and you know, you don't need anybody to teach you or to tell you about it. It's not, you don't need revelation. You don't need the prayer. You know that there are challenges, that there are forces, there are hard times, there are difficult things and all of that that are happening right, left, and center. That is why Jesus said, I tell you who a wise man is in Luke chapter 6, 48. I tell you who a wise man is. He says he's the one that built his house on a rock so that when the flood, when the rain, and when the wind come upon it, because your life is a building, you must face the rain, you must face the flood, you must face the wind. They will definitely come after you. Your fasting and your prayer, your whatever you are doing can never put it away. And so a lot of people have collapsed. A lot of buildings, we have a lot of collapsed spiritual buildings that are falling every day, every week, every month, as a result of what? Of the fact that the building, the foundation that was laid, we are very bad. We are very, very bad. And one thing about spiritual foundation is that because you don't see it with your physical eyes, and so you take a whole lot of things for granted. And so when the problem comes, when the challenge of life comes, you won't know what to do. You are confused. You buckle down under the weight of it. Today we have an unprecedented number of divorces and, and separations and all of that. It's my, no wonder Jesus said in Mark 38, Mark, Mark 8, 38, where no wonder he said this wicked and adulterous generation. I have never seen in my life 
the rate of divorce, I used to know about it. I used to see it, um, you know, to an extent in those days when we were in Abuja and all of that. <coughs> because we have somebody who works in the registry and all of that. And um, when she got talking with my wife and all, he said, guess what? 70% of the cases we have in the court, in the registry, are divorce cases and all of that. That was about 10, 15 years ago. But today, any side you turn, you turn this side, you see divorce, you see separation, you see all kinds of things. Very young people. What is the problem? Forty foundation. But nobody is talking about, you don't know, you can't. It's the same thing that is happening in the church today. We have thousands and millions of people who do not have the right kind of... That is why the Christianity that we have today is the way it is. That is why anybody that comes now, all his interest is what he can get. What he can... And if you know, you are not possible, if you are not... The person is not giving to stealing and all that. But he sits down here, he sees a phone that is idle and all that. There's no use to stealing. He sees a phone that is idle and all of, of, all of a sudden he begins to think about how to pick it. <coughs> It doesn't matter whether you are an apostle, whether you are a bishop, whether you are an archbishop and all that. If you don't have wrong fund, if you don't have the right foundation, you don't have the right foundation. And it's going to show. If it doesn't show now. You know there are collapsed buildings, buildings that collapse that are 30 years old. You know there are buildings that are 50 years that collapse. So it doesn't matter how long you have been in the ministry or how long you have been born again. So I'm just saying the importance of foundation can never be overemphasized. It affects everything that you do in this life. If you are starting a business, if you are starting a business and you don't have the right kind of foundation, you stole money from people to come and start business. Or when you are working for other people, you are pilfering and you are doing 419, you know those things that you are doing. And then when you finish, you now want to go and start on your own. You have laid a very bad foundation. It's going to show. If it doesn't show 10 days um, in a week, it will show in a month. If it's not in a month, in a year or a few times to come, it will definitely show. That's why Jesus Christ says, if you are not faithful in that which is another man, your own will not be given to you. So if you are not faithful and then finally you leave and then you want to go and start your own, you know your own will not be given. What it means is that that business will fail. There are so many companies and establishments that are struggling. Foundation is important. If I begin to talk about foundation, we will not close today. Pay attention to foundations. Pay attention to foundations. And if you have laid a wrong foundation in the course of our talking, our teaching and all of that, if you have had a, a wrong foundation, please, I advise that you go and write the wrong. Especially when it has to do with spiritual foundation. We have a window that God has given to us. And that window is a window for mercy and forgiveness repentance he will re forgive you he will cleanse you and then he will help you to rebuild he say you will become the, rebu the, the rebuilder of uh, dissolutions of many generations repairers of bridges that are broken it can be repaired amen so we talk about the foundation of our Christian faith. I know if I ask you now, what is the foundation of the Christian faith? There will be an echo. Jesus Christ. The rock. And that is correct. 100% correct. But you need to go beyond that 100%. You need to go beyond the knowledge that Jesus Christ is the foundation of the Christian faith. And going beyond that means you've got to come closer to understand who and why he is the foundation. What made him the foundation of that Christian faith? Why is he the foundation? Hello? Let me tell you 
Let me show you why the problem that we are having today, even among the apostles and geos and all of that, they are all rooted from or rooted to the foundation. Okay, Isaiah 28, 16. He said, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I lay, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone. This stone is a tried one. This stone is a precious corner stone. This stone is a sure foundation. Now, this is where he made a remark. He that believeth shall not make haste. That word, if you look at other translations, another translation say you will not be disappointed. In other words, when you put your faith on this, when you know and stand on this, he said you will never be disappointed. If you believe, in other words, if you are standing on this rock, you can be rest assured you will never be disappointed in your life. But there are so many Christians today who are being disappointed and they have taken to other alternatives. They have taken to other alternatives in seeking solutions to their, the challenges of their lives. Do you know the reason why when the Bible says, God says, when they curse you, what do you do? Give me Romans chapter 12, verse 28. <coughs> Romans 12, 20. He said, if your enemy is hunger, if your enemy is hungry, say, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him to drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. He said, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. How many people do this? As simple as it is. Do you know why you will not be able to overcome evil with good? When they, when your enemy is hungry, the one that you know that is your enemy and all of that, and you find out that he's hungry, go give him food to drink, give him water to drink. If he's in the trouble, go and help him out. But he's your enemy. How many of us will be able to do that? Do you know why we will not do that? You know what we do? We will be happy that he's suffering. Do you know why we do that? It's because of lack of the foundation. Because if you trust the one that tells you, if you believe in Jesus and trust him, if you trust him, if he tells you to go and give him food to eat, you will go. You will not doubt. The reason why we disobey, the reason why we don't want to follow this way is because we don't trust him. And why you don't trust him is because you don't know him. Knowing him does not mean knowing that Jesus is the Son of God. You have not had an experience of that man. That is why he said when they slap you on this thing, he said turn the other one. Because that is actually where the power of God is. Because that is what he said he is going to do. So if you believe him, if he said thou shalt not steal, you will not steal. If you trust him, he tells you, thou shalt not lie. You will not lie because he said so. You believe him. He said, God said, I will not lie and I will not lie. That means you know him. That means you know the rock upon which you stand. Just like Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. I know in whom I believed. Give it to me. Find it for me. I know in whom I believe. 2 Timothy 1.12 which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have what? Believed. Do you know? What you were talking about is, is, about, is because of the sufferings. It's because of what he is suffering, what he was going through. 
and he never buckled down and he never deviated or shifted a little to the right or a little to the left. He stood his ground. What is lacking in the body of Christ today is a lack of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's not knowing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and all of that. That's not what we're talking about. Even the devil knows. Even unbelievers, they know. Most of these musicians that you are hearing today, you are following, when they begin to be, be, sing their, oh, I, I see a whole, I read, I don't even spend time, I don't even, I see them when I open my phone to read, uh, check the news and all of that. You see them, I don't even go. Once I see, I just flip and go. In. They were once in the church. They were once in the music department. God was not coming through fast. And so they decided to look for other alternatives. What is the problem? Why would a pastor or a minister start looking for other means, diabolical means, in order to get a job done? Foundation. He doesn't believe it. Why will a pastor divide the church and then carry one members and go and start his own and all of that? Foundation. Because he doesn't trust him. What he says. Don't go steal another man's flock. Another man's labor to go and scatter. Because I hate this God. Everything, many is as a result of her. the reason why our faith is just shaking like this is just like uh, the problem is foundation. And what is that foundation? The knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, he said, I lay in Zion a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. A sure fact. See how many times he spent talking about defining and describing it. That whosoever will stand on this, you will never be disappointed in this life. Because we have seen God as God of Ozibo. Ozibo. What God essentially, see, see, the, see what God does in your life so that you can learn to trust this. See what it does in your life. God primarily, over and above your welfare, over and above, you say, I know, I wish above all things that thou prosper and be in health, even as your soul prosper. God, over and above your welfare and all of that, the very primary thing that the number one thing that God wants to do in your life, the number one thing that God wants to do in your life, the first is not to give you food to eat. The first is not to give you a breakthrough. If you don't understand this statement, you will never be strong in the Lord. You will never. <clears throat> so what is the first thing that he wants? And that is what God concentrates on. And that is what is confusing a lot of people. That is why a lot of people don't have faith and hope and trust. That's why they don't want to give the full attention and commitment. That's why they have alternatives. <clears throat> So what is the first thing that God wants to do in your life? The very first. You know what it is? Who can tell? You can even read. He's, in the, he's scattered everywhere in the Bible. He says, It is God that is at work in you. Both to do what? And to do of your good pleasure. I don't know, we are not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that is what he said. It, give it to me, Philippians 2, 13. For it is God who does what? Who is working in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Not your good pleasure. So what is the good pleasure of God? We use scripture to explain scriptures. If you go to the book of Philip, Ephesians 1, you see the good pleasure of God even before the foundation of the earth. That we will walk in love, in purity, in holiness before Him. This is what God is working. So He uses, and how He does it is that He uses situations and circumstances to, to work it out in you. Why did he say that he suffered them in the wilderness, the children of Israel, from when they left Egypt? He said he suffered them in the what? 
in the wilderness. He withdrew the food because the primary goal is to work out his good pleasure in this world. He says, so, give me Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, 3, 4. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord your God, thy God, led thee forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thy heart, whether thou wouldest keep his words, commandment or not. And he humbled thee and he suffered you to hunger. Is it not the same hunger, the same welfare and all of that he wanted to provide for you, he removed it. If you don't get this thing, if you, you see, until this revelation dawns on you, you can never, you see, you see this Jesus Christ, you see this your faith, you see this your standing on the rock and all of that, you will never know. You will know that in every situation, God wants to work out his good pleasure in you. God wants to make you a better person like Jesus Christ. He wants to draw you closer. He wants you to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That is his primary goal. And when that is in place, every other thing follows. Every other thing follows on its own. You don't need to be fasting and crying and breaking your head about breakthrough, about open door. Just concentrate on this. Know the reason why he's doing this thing. He wants to have... Why did he say... He, he, he gave... He, he made them husband and wife. The Bible says, why did he make them one? He was seeking godly seed. So... What God is looking in that union is children that are. And everything that he's doing in that your family, in that your life and all of marriage is to produce that godly seed. Because we have, you see, what we have been taught over the years are wrong doctrine. He said, I know you have need for all this. But do what? Go seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do you know what it means to seek the righteousness of God? You're going to suffer. The thing is that when your mind, when this becomes your primary goal, when this thing, when you understand that this is what it is, that is the reason why when you, maybe your husband annoys you, you see it as an opportunity for you to test the water, to test how far you have walked with Christ. Whether you are going to fight back, whether you are going to retort, whether you are going to say something bad or, or not, or when your wife inf uh, abuses you or insults you, how do you respond? That is actually the time when you need to know for yourself whether you are actually advancing or not. If this is your focus, if this is your goal, if this is your objective, let me tell you every other thing. When even at the thoughts, at the thought level about a need in your life, God provides it. I've said it over and over and over. Look at us where two or three are gathered <coughs> in the church. Look at how what God has done in the space of how many years? Five years or thereabout. I want you to go and ask, look at every other person who have followed the way we did. You know, you have served somebody over 20, 20 something years. Because I started in that ministry while I was in the university. I graduated, came out, I still continued here. And then I got officially ordained as a pastor. I and my wife in the same year, the same time, the same place and all that. In 1996. And we served and served and served. At the end of the day, nobody gave you one cobble, nobody gave you one naira, and they painted you black. So everybody distances you. And I came out with a very big hot inside of me. And I knew I was not going to, I won't be able to start any work for God and all of because my heart and all of that was not right. So with all that, because at the end of the day, God just came through to us and had mercy. And finally, we met with our geo and all of that. We rejoined, he blessed us and released us and all of that. And then with all the promises that we are giving, he, was, he made to us and all of that. Not half was done, not one dot, not one. So we were on your own. So see where we are today. 
there is nobody, all the people that know us, they say nobody will go through this kind of a thing. And you have this level of achievement or success in, in the, according to their words and all of that. Why is it like that? Hello, just like 26 of Proverbs verse 2 says, there is no cause, with, and a causeless cause shall not come. In other words, there is no, every cause has a reason. In the same way, when you see something that is happening good, there is always a reason why it is happening. There is a reason. So find out when you see the glory, tell the story. There is a story behind the glory. But people, they don't want to look at the story. They just want to embrace the glory, the success, the affluence, and all of that. And because things are happening, and then you become, you join the band of God. And you continue like that. You don't know the reason why the person got there. So what brought us to this point? is because my primary goal, my primary agenda, my drive, everything, and you hear me say it over and over, I want to serve Jesus Christ acceptably and accept no service. And if you're going to serve him acceptably, then you have to sit down and watch and look at, find out what are those acceptable things. And if you want to follow it, it's going to slow you down. You're not going to move at your pace. If you want to blow this church down, you see, you won't have space here every day. If I build, I'm not going to do it. I know what we'll do. Don't start miracle, breakthrough, open doors, <clears throat> and it will be happening in life, and you'll be seeing it, and they will be coming. When we were women who win, when you know, then you was also man who win, because I was part of it. So when women gather, I also gather, I also be there with them. It was miracle galore. At a point when the meeting starts by 6 o'clock. By 5 o'clock, the whole place is jammed, filled. You won't have space. See, when you come to Christ, when you got born again and all of that, he used it to get your attention. It's written in the book of Romans chapter 2, verse 4. He said, don't you despise the goodness of God, oh man. That it is his mercy, his goodness that draws you, that leads you to repentance, so that you come closer to him. Oh, despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that his goodness of the of God leadeth thee to repentance. That is why he's doing all this in is to draw you to himself. And then when he draws you to himself, he's not breaking you. Is the reason why. And when he's not succeeding in doing that, he's not happy. That's why a lot of us do not want to stay. That's why we don't trust in this foundation. So you would think that God is too, is too slow. And the people have actually, if you read the book of Peter, people are saying that God is too slow. You know why? Because he wants to form Christ in you. He wants you to be Jesus Christ. You know what he said? He said he wants to, he, introduced, he brought his son Jesus Christ and said, I want every other one, every other seed that comes on earth to be like. If God wants to fill the entire generation, the entire creation with his own kind of people. So how are we going to get it? How are we going to get there? If only your concern, if only our primary pursuit and concern is about breakthrough, is about the fruit of the womb, is about the fruit of the heart, is about the fruit of the of the of the bank, is about fruit everywhere, open doors and breakthroughs and blessings and healings and all of that. Whenever there is a problem in your life, it is an avenue opportunity for God to work out His good pleasure. In you. That should be your primary goal. And when this becomes your primary goal, you will learn to trust him. That's why, you know what Job said? He said, even though he slay me, <laughs> find it for me. Though he does what, well, yet will I do what? Well? Can you see? How many of us can say this? In this, hello, you know what is the major, you know, uh, sometimes, 
you just go home and if you actually think through, you go home and you'll be crying. Even when you get to pray, you'll be crying. Do you know why? These people, they did not have the Holy Ghost inside them. Do you know these people, they were never born again. They were just operating under the old covenant that was made with animal blood. The Bible says we have a better covenant than them. Yeah, look at what, look at their testimonies. How much more us? The Bible says, if the blood of heifers and gold and, and whatever could not wash out there, he said, how much more with the blood of Jesus Christ, through the eternal Spirit of God, purge our conscience to serve the living God? How much more? Although, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, punch your conscience from dead world to serve the living God? Even though he slay me, he's the same Jesus, and you would trust him to that much. This is our problem. This is the problem we have in Christian. This is the foundation. You see, this is where the foundation is. That is the reason why the man that came to Jesus Christ and said, my father was dead. Let me go and bury my father. You know what he said to him? He said, don't go. How many of us will take it? How many of us will take it? You, you know it is easy. We say we have very academy now and all of that and going on and stuff like that. That is call of God. That is God's call. And then something is calling your attention in the village or your brother or your sister or your cousin or somewhere and all of that. That's how it is. That's the kind of test. And he hasn't even gotten to death. Maybe now they are doing wedding or they are doing this or they are doing that or they are doing one function or whatever. There is an emergency and you are needed at home. And God, you want me to say, uh, uh, thus says the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord said, thou should not go. He said, let the dead go bury their dead. Just ordinary, a man said, in his that same Matthew 10, the, uh, another man just came and said, just to go, I know, I have agreed I'm going to follow you. I will serve you for the rest of my life and all of that. I, in fact, I have dedicated my life and everything. All, all that I'm asking, Lord, just to say bye-bye to them and tell them that I'm not coming. He said, don't go. You know, we hear this, we do. when we read it, we leave it in the air. Is actually bringing in. You see, when until you sit down and think through, meditate, find the meaning, the reason why he said what he said. This is what makes the difference. This is the reason why a, a Christian is different from another Christian. This is why a believer is different from another believer. This is what separates the boys from the men in the kingdom of God. This is it. Nothing else. <laughs> When you come, come to the point where you know that you know that you know, even though he slay me, sometimes rain will be falling and you will know that it is a test. Rain, it will be falling cats and dogs and there is prayer meeting. It's a time to test the level of your commitment to him. He said, um, hey, the flood is too much. Hey, the water is too much. Hey, you know that place, hi, I'm going to cross now. Have you forgotten that there are people who die? They've cut their head. Your own is to cross the water. Your own is to cross the water. Your own is to enter the rain. Not that anybody is going to kill you. Just that the rain is going to beat you while you are coming to church. That is a big problem. But there are people who they say deny Christ. They say no. And they chop up their head and they die. How much more? They showed me a picture of a young man in a, a, a person in Joss. This banditry, bandits and all of that came and said, deny Jesus Christ. And whether they are Boko Haram or whatever, he said no. AK-47 are the very close range. They opened the bullet. The thing scattered one of his head. And God kept him alive. And the guy who was still saying in that video, he said he loved those people that Jesus loved and he loves them. See, see the kind of, have you seen the kind of, Jesus Christ that we are following is different from another Jesus Christ. This is the reason why we don't have trust in him. Because our mind and our attention have been programmed to. If you are got born again, if you get saved, God is going to help you. God is going to see you through. God is going to deliver you from your problem. God is going to answer all your problems. God is going to do this because he's a faithful God. He's a merciful God. He's a kind God. His loving kindness is better than life. I agree. But when you come closer to God, he will tell you, the reason why I brought you 
is to make you like Christ. And I cannot make you like Christ when you are living and having your bath in a jacuzzi, water, sleeping on waterbed. He will see me there. You are going to be using stone for your pillow. You are going to be hiding in a house when the rain falls. The, the roof is leaking and the water is coming from the ground. And you will get up and you will see stand one place and you will be praying in tongues. As the water is shifting closer to you, you will be shifting and you will be praying in tongues and blessing God. Uh -huh. You have arrived. Anyone that put his trust in him, he will never be disappointed. Why we get so disappointed is because we are looking at the wrong thing. We think that once you come to Jesus Christ, he's going to bless you. This is what, this is what they have sold to us over the years. Go out now, even amongst us. Just say you want to do business with somebody here. Just give the person 20,000, just 20,000 to do X, Y, Z and then come back. You got, five minutes later, you call him on the phone. The phone is switched off. Not available. He's gone. And when you finally see him, one story to another, um, actually what happened is that no fear, no respect. God said, lie not to one another. You know why? Because he said so, I will not lie to you. It doesn't matter. Even if it means me being ashamed, I would rather swallow the shame and tell you the truth. That is a person who has known him Job, Job 13, 15, even though he slay me. It was Job that was talking. Look at what the man, the prophet Habakkuk said. Although the fig tree will not, the olive will fail. All the flock, everything, everything, Boboe will collapse. Yet, because I know him. The reason why he would say that, because he knew who he was, who he is. We don't preach. This message is gone and gone and gone. This teaching is gone and gone and gone. You will never hear it anywhere. This last place where I went, not some, not last place, somewhere I went to pray. They said that I'm too rigid. I'm too rigid. That's where the the Ogabata said. That's what he was telling my wife. You know that we are not that they are not as rigid as us. That we are. They are. What make me? Why am I rigid? What is he calling rigid? Because I say you should not be pressing phone in the church. Because I say you should not be coming late to church to meet with God. Because God is there. God cannot be there before you should be there before God. That's why I'm rigid. And so that's what he's selling. It's the same thing that every other person is there. So that's why we are having the kind of thing that we are having. I've told you. If you want to become an engineer, if you want to be a medical doctor, if you want to be a specialist in any, you know what you do? There is a system that processes you. You start from primary school. From your primary school, you go to secondary school. From say, And as you are going, you are writing an exam. If you don't pass, you are not going to go to the next class. And so they do all that. You get to university, to higher institution. You start from year one. And then they process you and you will be le receiving lecture. And you are going to be sitting for exam. If you fail that exam, you are not going to go to the next class. And so you will be committed to that and diligently do that. And then after four years or five years or six years, as case may be, you are a graduate. You become a pharmacist. You become a doctor, you become a lawyer, you become an engineer, you become whatever it is that you have studied. Means you are now qualified to operate. Then when it matters, when it comes to spiritual matters, no, no, just get born again, just say, answer, utter call. How many people want to give their life to, if you don't even give your life to Christ, what you do is that you receive Christ. You know what it means to give your life to Christ? That you have collected your life, you have handed it over to Christ. You are no longer yourself. But are you longer? You, are you saying that's, that's not the truth? What you have done is that you just received Christ. So when you say, How many people have received Christ? How many people want to receive Christ or want to give their life to Christ? That's a normal, which is error. But that has become the normal thing. Anywhere, anywhere, big, small, medium church, who wants to give his life to Christ? They come. They don't give nothing. And what you do is that say after me, say after me, Jesus, Jesus, 
Come into my life. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. And be my Savior. And be my personal Savior. My name is written in the book of my name is written in the book of life. I am born again. I am born again. Say you are born again. I am born again. Say I am born again. I am born again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Put your hands together for them. There is somebody that is waiting for you there. Just follow him. Case closed. Nothing else. You see what we are doing with God. If I say this thing, you will not believe me. If I say this, you will think I am just stuck it because I'm a pastor. Over 90% of the people you see in the church are not born again. If I say it, you will not believe me. You think I am joking or whatever. Believe me, trust me, trust what I'm telling you. I don't mean 90% of the community, including people who are preaching from the pulpit. I mean they have not received Christ into their heart. We are not talking about giving their life. They have not received it. Does anybody have a, a phone or something that is white? This is somebody's heart as an unbeliever. Is not born again. This is the state of his heart. He's dark. He might be a professor. He might be a professor. He might be whatever you call your name. If you have not received Christ, this is how the heart of that person is. Then, the person now gets born again. He has a new heart. Hmm? He has a new heart. This heart is given to him by God. The evidence is like black and white. Can you tell me, explain to me please. Somebody had been blind for 20 years. He was born blind. And then he grew up 20 years old, born blind. He had never seen light. Hmm? And then a miracle takes place. And the eyes open and the person sees. What will be the person's reaction? What, 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 can you imagine? How can you hazard the kind of reaction and feeling uh, the person will have? What will be like? You know, you know why you you are confused. You don't know. You know why you are confused. You don't know what will happen. Because the person will just the eyes will just open. Pow. For the first time in his life, he sees and he is normal. He says, ah, ah, ah. Hey, you praise God, though. Is that what he will do? What will he do? Joy. Joy unspeakable. He will be shouting everywhere. Come and see. Come and see. I can see. Is this you? So this is how you look like. So this is how a house look like. Because you have never seen a house. You have never seen a human being the way they look. They have never seen a car, how he looks. They have never seen main road, how he looks. Excitement. And then somebody is born again. He become a new creation. And you are normal. And you are just normal. And even when they are saying, say after me, say after me. Jesus, Jesus, come, come. Into, into. My life, my life. Why they are saying that he has gone. And he will blow. There is one that you will He withdraw it again. He is also in altar call. Come back and go back far. See, eh? we need, is is a very, very pathetic situation. It's a very gory situation. It's a very bad situation that the church has gotten herself into. And I don't know how that means, means miracle. That's why when we talk about remnant, remnant. That's what the remnant is all about. Not that you have a group of people who are singing and praising God and saying you are calling yourself remnant. That's not it. People who have gone back to the ancient landmarks, do not shift it. The way they got born again 2,000 years ago is the same way they got born again today. Not all these things that we are doing. Have a lot of people in the church that are not born again. And so what, what, what are we doing? So this is how it is. You know, I'm done with foundation now. You can see. First, there are process written in the Bible. Clear, in black and white. Spelled out. And it is left for you to abide by it. It is left for you not to abide by it. 
I have told you about foundation. If you don't follow this, you can't have a good foundation. You cannot lay foundation for three, three, a three bedroom bungalow. And then you want to build an upset on it. That building is going to collapse. That building is an accident waiting to happen. And when it collapses, lives are going to go. Destinies of men are going to be destroyed. Resources are going to be wasted. If you want to lay a good foundation, then you must be born again. And I have read for you, I have shown you scriptures beyond every doubt. I remember when I started talking about this and preaching about this, a lot of people were, I was witnessing a lot of break, a lot of resistance. But like I said, I open the scriptures, I show you, I am not the one that put it there. Jesus with his own mouth. Go ye into the world and preach the gospel. Whosoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you remove the word baptized and say whosoever believes shall be saved, it's not complete. You have and see anytime you are reading a you see, um, like um, my own approach in this in the Bible, the way I go through the Bible is that I do study. And the study, the type of study that I do is topical studies. I study topics. I am interested in the doctrines. Jesus Christ said, if anyone will obey me, you will know the doctrine. I'm interested in the doctrine. So I stayed on the doctrine a lot. So when I study, I have a better understanding. And God opens up a whole lot of things. What majority of the things that I share and I teach and I preach, I didn't, it's not that I opened the scripture and then I'll be joining scriptures and all of that. So, if you remove baptized, it will not be complete. So, what you do is that when you want to study a, a particular topic, you gather all the scriptures in the Bible that said something about it so that you have a holistic view of it. Because if you just pull one scripture like that, you're going to go into error. Because if he say it is just being born again that he saved and all of that, then Jesus that said, except a man be born of the spirit and of, born of water and of the spirit, he said you cannot do what? Enter the kingdom. You can't enter the kingdom of God. So what is he talking about? And I showed you in the Old Testament church, the church in the wilderness, according to Acts of Apostles chapter 7, he calls it the church in the wilderness. That Old Testament sense is a type of church. And they went through the same four processes, the same four stages. You must undergo them. You give your life or receive Jesus Christ into your heart. Number two, you got baptized in water. Number three, you got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Number four, you continually always partake of the communion. This is what qualifies you now for the next stage, which is called discipleship. If you have not done that, you cannot be a disciple. You know the cost of being a disciple. He said, if anyone will not leave father, mother, brother, sister, land, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. So somebody who is not yet initiated into the kingdom have not received the grace to follow cannot take it. There were things that according to book of Matthew 19, Jesus Christ was telling them, he said, how many, uh, they said, why then did Moses, because he was talking about divorce and all of that, he, they were now asking him, uh, why did Moses give them this uh, commandment that they, they should give them certificate of this divorce? He says, because of the hardness of your heart, you guys are very stubborn. That's why God had permitted it. It was permissive will of God, not the perfect will of God. So, he said, for this reason, you shall leave your father and mother and join and both of you become one. Being born again, being baptized in the water, being baptized in the spirit, and taking communion every week, constantly, is a requirement for you to enter into discipleship. If you have not done this, the grace will not be made available in your life. 
to be able to because this one is a hard saying. So when they ask Jesus Christ, so Jesus now said, anyone that marries a man that is divorced or marries a woman that is divorced is living in adultery. And they said this, they, they said to Jesus Christ, he said, this one is a hard saying, Lord. This one where they talk now, in their heart, Lord. And Jesus said, it is not given to you. It's not for everybody. It's for those of them who it is given. The grace is given to them to obey. So, having done that, now that you are saved, now that you are born again, now that you have been initiated into the body of Christ, what does uh, being born again, what does it do to you? What it does is that what happens at new birth is that God, if you read Ezekiel 20, 36, 26, what, 26 and 27, what he says there is that I will take away the old heart, that stubborn heart that doesn't obey God. I will take it away. I'm not going to repair it. I'm not going to renovate it. I'm going to take it away completely and I will give you a brand new heart. Just like somebody goes and his car is not good and he's giving problems. So what he did was he just take it to the Mercedes company and all of that and they gave you a brand new engine. Tear rubber engine. He put it inside that car. So your heart is changed. And not only that your heart is changed. He said I'll put a new spirit inside of you. And not only that I'll put a new spirit inside of you. I'll put my spirit inside of you. And not only that, I will put my spirit inside of I will write my laws in your heart. And I will cause you to obey them. Look at it. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgment and do them. This is what happened when you receive Christ into your heart. That is the first stage. Then when you get to the second stage, what happened in the second stage? When you get baptized in water because he says... Except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's what he said in John chapter 5, verse John 3, 5. And so what happens at water baptism? Why the water baptism in the first place? Romans chapter 6, verse 4 tells us, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also walk in the newness of life, verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also, we shall be also in the likeness of his what? Resurrection, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is what? Crucified with him. This battle that you are fighting over the years, this besetting sin, this level of, uh, of stubbornness, that is your old nature. It's a mystery about water baptism. It is not just entering inside the water. You identify what it means is that all the garbages you have carried over, all those things you have done in the flesh, your stubbornness, the sins you have committed, and the things that all those you are whatever. Once you enter inside the water, there is a mystery. It means that you are now dead. And as you are coming out from that water onto the resurrection, just like Jesus Christ, you are come out of that water. Every other thing, all those old things and all of that. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. That is when old things, you drop them behind you. You come out of that water. That thing is deliverance. Did you hear what I said? Yes, sir. How do I know? Because you borrow a leaf from the old. You know that Red Sea they passed through? It was a water baptism. I hope you know. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 10. That's water baptism. What happened? The Pharaoh and his army, they were after them. The enemies, the things that have, have plagued them over life. Bondage that have been in for 400 years. It was in that Red Sea. They buried them. You look back again, all those old lifestyle and all of that that you have been struggling with, buried. If you see people who are not, that is why they keep on struggling. They say they struggle, they struggle with this. If you actually look well into their life, one thing is that is either they are not born again or they have not gone through this process. That deliverance will not come. If you like, come out and be say, the only thing that you will do when the fire of God is too much on the altar, when you are doing deliverance, you start. You start, you seeing them like this, dancing, 
demon of one leg and be rotating. And then the next thing, they, they fall on the ground and roll. And when they finish rolling and will get up, the problem is still there. Because you are not initiated in the kingdom. What we need in the church, in the house of God, in the body of Christ, is precept upon precept, line upon line, teaching. Teaching brings understanding. Understanding brings knowledge. Knowledge brings, it brings revelation knowledge. It makes you rooted and grounded. So when you open your mouth to speak, you speak from the place of authority and power. Not because another person, the name of Jesus Christ, that the Paul, knowing that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be what? Destroyed. That henceforth you should not serve sin. You won't be a slave of sin anymore. What about this? That's what it produces. I went through it. I did it. I knew what happened. I knew the struggles that I used to have. Gone. If I have challenges, it's the challenges ahead. Not the one behind. Not, not anything from behind that is following me. No, not one. Okay, so let's progress so that because we must close. You know what I'm doing? I'm taking one, two, three together. Number one, understanding the foundation laying the foundation building on the foundation that's what i am doing you will see what will happen to you at the end of this at the end of i have seen it and that is why this thing god said go raise for me men and women i can trust i can trust with my presence i can trust with my glory i can trust with my power God, there are so many who have betrayed him. Many. And if you have the ear of heaven, if you're actually praying, if you are hearing from God, go. God will speak to you the kind of people that he wants. Not the big... You can't break it. You see, brethren, you see your calling. Not the big and mighty. Not the affluent. It's not that God cannot use the big and the mighty or the wise or the rich. But that rich will have to humble himself. You come down from that top where you are. You have to bring yourself down. Because he said, go preach the gospel to who? To the meek. So when a big man, a rich man comes and becomes meek, eh, he's qualified. But that be, because you, you are still struggling, you don't have money and all that, doesn't make you meek. As a matter of fact, the most proud people that I have ever met are poor people. You don't think so? You don't think, you don't believe it. <laughs> have you, have you driven on the road where you want to cross, then you see, an, you see one jeep, black jeep, a big man, a rich man, he's, maybe he's on the stair, yeah, on the steering on top of that. And you come, and then you see a taxi. What do you think, what do you think they do? The taxi man, eh? He will run and blow and the enter. The jeep will just stop and allow you. When you have finished going, you will follow. You will see another, another, another kabu kabu, whatever. And all the one that has one light and one headlamp and one trouble, he will put in his head. He will be struggling to prove that. But you see this other world, they will just allow you. Check, try it. Observe it. Watch tomorrow. So that you are, you are, you know what will reveal what is in your heart. As you are looking at, you look humble now and so quiet and so gentle. Let them, let, let them just put like 500,000 naira in your hand now. The thing that is inside of you will come out. Just 500,000 is too much. There are people who have not seen 500,000 naira together. You won't sleep in the night again. If you hear horn, you think that they are coming to carry, to, to take the 200,000 naira that you have in the house. Thank you very much. No, just do what I ask you to do. So you get born again, go filled with the Holy Spirit, do what you're about, what about is in, you take your communion, then you're qualified for discipleship. And then when you come to discipleship, <coughs> there is a kind of food you must eat, not any kind. They must place you on a particular type of spiritual diet. If you don't eat it, you will be deformed. You will become developed. You become a washoko Christian, malnourished Christian. There are three spiritual, spiritual nourishments, classes of food. Number one is the milk. 
The Bible calls it the milk of God's word. You must drink of milk. I have not seen a mother that gave birth to a child that started that child with a band with you. No matter how poor you are, you start with breast milk. That is what he said in 2 Corinthians, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. As newborn babes, as newborn babes, now that you are born anew, what does he say you should do? The sincere milk of the word that you may do what? Grow thereby. Desire the sincere milk. How many of us drank that milk when you got born again? How many of us drank the milk when you got born again? So what is the milk? You drank it. What milk? What are the milk of God's milk? The word of God. You've seen our problem. No, I disagree. Give me Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teacheth you, which be the first principle of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of what? But what he taught them was the first oracle. He said, but you still have need of milk, not of strong meat. Strong meat is God's word, is it not? It's the word of God. Milk is also what? The word of God, is it not? So, but there are different types. It's not the same. There is milk and there is strong meat. They are not the same. You must feed on the milk before you get to. And after that, there is another one. First Corinthians chapter 3, 1 to 3. First Corinthians chapter 3, 1 to 3. He said, and brethren, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but unto you as unto what? Carnal, even as unto what? Babes in Christ. Have you seen it? Verse 3. I have fed you with what? So what milk did he say? Paul, Peter said it. Paul is repeating the same thing. So what is that milk? If you don't feed a growing child milk, if you don't give, that child will not be... That's why you have the person. When you see, he, how old are you? He says he's 30, but he's not above three feet. Dwarf. Have you seen dwarf before? Naturally, physically. Have you seen dwarf before? You have such people in the spirit. Spiritual dwarf. That's what it is like. And what it means, you can't carry heavy load. You are not strong. If you look in the natural, the, what are the contents of the milk, what it provides, you know that there are some ingredients and all of that that are inside the milk that gives the baby immunity and gives him strength. And you see the person that drank milk when he's growing up and all of that. If you look at the, if you look at the eye, the white side of the eye, he's sharp, white, white, sharp. He has a lot of vitamin A inside it. They grow up, they are very healthy. They are very intelligent. They are very smart. They are very inquisitive. They are not laid back. In the spiritual, the same thing happens. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. So there is a milk. And then after that milk, there is another one. It's called the meat. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Matthew chapter 15. Go to verse 20. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat, okay, we don't watch and not defile a man. Okay, verse 21. So Jesus went hence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is grievously what? Vexed with what? What was, he, what was this woman asking Jesus to do? Deliverance, healing. Is it not? Okay. But he answered her not a word, and his disciple came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cried after us. But he answered and said, I have not sent unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 25. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Verse 26. But he answered, I said, It is not meet to take the children's what? And what is the children's bread now? What is the children's bread? Uh -huh. Breakthrough. Uh -huh. Prosperity. Uh -huh. Miracles and uh -huh. deliverance. Promotion. 
All of this is called what? All of this is called what? What do we hear in the church every day? What do we hear in the church every day? Children's bread, not even milk. We've not talked about what is the milk of God's word. But what we have made joy. You see the same thing that I'm telling you. That the very first thing that God wants to do in your life is not to give you bread. It's for you to have the milk. Because he's training you. There is a process. It's a school. The church is supposed to be a school. The church is supposed to be a school. The church is supposed to be a school. Where you teach people. Precept upon being. You have a system. Where you pass the people. And not this crash program. Is that, uh, you just gather them. And then you just talk. And when you finish. You don't even know whether they heard what you said or not. And all of, and the spiritual thing. And spiritual thing. You don't absorb it. You don't, you don't digest it the way you digest natural thing. You have to prepare for it. If you're actually interested in making disciples of men. If, if I am actually interested in making you conform to the image of Jesus Christ. First of all I have to sit down and find that what it means to conform to be conformed to the image of Jesus. What does it require to conform to the image of Jesus Christ? And how can it be done? When I am done with this, I can now come. So that is the reason why when I stand speaking, I won't, I won't just be talking like a fool. I won't just be talking like a man, man. I won't just be beating about the bush. I won't just be talking in order to add to the number or to fulfill the number and the time and all of it. I will be talking with the person compassion with a very deep sense of responsibility knowing that the whole lot is committed into my heart hello it is when i do this kind of a thing that is how god pays me this is how we are paid that's why when you finish that god he might not even be here he could be here he could be outside of this place and god touches somebody and the person blesses you but when I just stand here and all I'm giving you is bread, it shall prosper in Jesus' name. You will be the head and not the tail in Jesus. Are you not saying amen? Yes. You will be the head and not the tail. Yes. You will live in a house you didn't buy. You will you drive a car you didn't buy. You will live a house you didn't build. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. And then when you share the grace, you see people, they will line up. They want to see pastor. Uh -huh. We have arrived. Hello. When the flood comes, <laughs> when the flood comes, he will see them. He will level them. And they will, you know, at a point, at a point, Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life in you. Every one of them, all those men that have been following the miracle and all of that, everyone decided, what did I tell you before? That this man has a demon inside him. Now that demon has in, he said that we, we should eat his flesh and drink his blood. Just that he said that too. When the hour of temptation came, when he finished praying at Gethsemane and all of that, he said now is the, uh, the time of the priest of the power of the day and all of that. And then when they came to arrest him and all of that, all those men, the, all the thousands of people that were there, every one of them deserted him. They left him on one. Peter even denied him. Those who are eating bread. When the chips are there, you look back, you will see one of them. Everybody will disappear. Job that said, even though he slay me, I will not disappear. I will stay there. I will be with you. But what will these people do? Before you say Jack Robinson, they are gone. Bread. What are the milk of God's word? The milk of God's word are those foundation. Those basic foundational things that you need to know. They are very basic. First Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10 or verse 9. For we are God's, we are the laborers together with God. You are God's bound husbandry. You are God's building. Verse 10. According to the grace which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid what? The foundation. And another built it thereof. But let every man take it heed, or take heed how he built it of their report. I have laid the foundation, the basics. And so what are those basic foundations that he has laid? And he went further to say, for no other foundation can any man lay than that is laid, which is who? 
is the foundation of Christ. That is what I was telling you in the beginning. You must know the foundation upon which you are standing. And I spent time to tell you the reason why a lot of us don't stand on this foundation. Because we have a wrong perception, a wrong idea, knowledge about what it means to come to Christ. Because we just left the milk and we concentrate on the bread. So the milk of the word of God is Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ. Have you seen it? The principles, the doctrine, the basics, the foundation. Leaving them. Let us move on to what? Maturity. Hard meat. Strong meat. He said, therefore, leaving the principles of doctrines of Christ. Let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of what? You see what are those basic foundations are? Repentance from where? From dead works, faith towards God. Baptism, water baptism. You talk about baptisms. There are actually three baptisms there. He said the water baptism, the Holy Ghost baptism, and I'm baptizing into his suffering. Of the doctrines of baptism and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And then you sit on each and every one of them and begin to dissect it. And they are very deep. But these are all these foundational. These are just the elementary, the basics. It is lack of the knowledge of this one that makes you live so carelessly. You don't know that there is a future, that there is a hope. Like this man that said that we saw a city. Whose builder and maker is God? He said they were looking forward to it because if they were looking back, they would have been, they would have gone back where they came from. But they saw a city. So they agreed towards it. It is in the doctrines of foundation of Christ. That's where you learn it. These are the things that when we are taught in those days and we read it and we studied it and went through it and all of that, we are convinced there is eternal judgment. There is judgment that is coming to every man, every woman. It will put fear in your heart. Because when you hear, when you read this and you are taught and all of that, what happens is that the Holy Spirit writes it with his finger in your heart and it becomes indelible. It guides you. So when you want to misbehave and all of that, Holy Spirit pops it up. You know it is appointed unto man to die once. And after that, judgment. And we read and studied about the judgment of God. It will help you put. That's why the Bible says, knowing therefore the terror of God. But all these things are not taught. So we, that is why you will lie. So there are things that when you know about the, you know that your life, this life you are living, you have a record. You are going to answer to everything that you say. You say even an idle word. He said, every idle word that proceeds out of your mouth, you will be judged. You will stand in judgment for it. No, when we come to eternal judgment, you will see. And now, there is eternal judgment. There is two types of judgment. There is judgment in time. And there is eternal judgment. That is, why you are here on this earth, you will judge yourself. If you fail to judge yourself, on that other side, there is no mercy. There is nothing like, Lord, I am sorry. All the sorry that you need, that is where repentance is now. These are the things that bring fear in the heart of people. That is where you get, that is how we say you can be in Psalm, in Psalm 34 verse 14 or so. David said, I will teach you the fear of God. This is how you teach the fear of God. But everything is, that's why you enter the church. People lie, we lie from the pulpit, we lie and cheat everyone and do all kinds of things and all of that. And we don't know, and you think you are smart and you do it and get away with it. You divorce your wife, you are sleeping around, you are doing all that, you are, you are a wife beating. You are a husband snatcher. You are all kinds of whatever. You are doing it and you are getting away. Don't worry. The day of reckoning will come. Whether you believe it or you don't believe it. Whether you know it or you don't know it. Whether you are aware or you are not aware. You know what Jesus said in the last chapter of Revelation chapter 22. He said, let the one that is forward continue to be forward. Let the one that see continue to be silly. Let the one that is holy continue to be silly, holy. Whatever it is that you are doing, just go ahead and be doing. He said, behold, I'm coming with my reward. Father, we thank you for the entrance of your word gives light. It's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. Help us, Lord. Open our eyes, Father. Write them. Help us to so that it becomes indelible in our lives, in our hearts. Lord, I trust you. 
to build an army like you promise an army that is going to emerge not men that are known worldwide they are men that are of no repute no reputation nobody knows them nobody hears about them they are if it's insignificant because you say that you these are the choices material that you use to bring about your glory father we thank you just like jesus re rejoiced he said these things are kept away from the high and the mighty uh, but you have revealed them to your babes to the babes thank you so much wonderful lord i trust you i give you all the praise and glory until we meet tomorrow remain blessed and remain rapturable i bring the covering of the precious blood of jesus christ over your life over your family over your inheritance over everything that has to do with your life you are secured in the love of god you are secured in the blood of jesus you are secured in the presence of god in the name of jesus christ thank you father glory be to your name in jesus precious name we pray amen